Hello everyone. So as I discussed in class, um, one of the things that we're going to do for your independent uh, research projects is we're going to mine some data, some molecular data, out of GenBank. And I want to show you how I did that for each of your matrices um, that I've placed up on Blackboard. Okay, so what I'm using is a, a program called Genius. You have to pay for this program. And what Genius does is it helps you organize your sequence files. Okay, and so one of the things that I did to um, put your data matrices together was I actually searched GenBank within Genius. And so if I select to search within Genius um, or within GenBank for nucleotide sequences of, say, Physalis longifolia, What the program does is it goes online, it searches GenBank, which is a sort of national repository, or actually an international repository of gene sequences. Okay, And so what it's doing now is it's showing me all of the sequence files that it has for the species Physalis longifolia. What I tried to do in picking the genes that you're going to be analyzing for your independent project was I tried to make sure that at least four of the five in-group taxa you um, used had the same gene sequence. So, for example, at least four species would have a sequence of turn LF, and at least four species would have a sequence of ITS or MACK, whichever gene, um, whichever gene was in common. And so, for Physalis longifolia, I kind of searched around in GenBank before I started putting together the file. And I found that um, a really common gene um, that is present in almost all of the taxa that Kim Lehman's studying for her independent project, a really common gene is this gene call, called the granule bound starch synthase gene. And it's also nicknamed Waxy. And so all I did for her data set was I literally just dragged these files into a folder called GBSSI or granule bound starch synthase 1. Okay. <clears throat> Once I did that, I sort of dragged in all of the gene sequences, including her outgroup, for uh, many of her in-group taxa. So if you look at these individual gene sequences, they look a little strange. So you have to kind of go way up in magnification here. And you can see it's giving us the gene sequence here. Okay. But it's hard to really do anything with this with these individual gene sequences. Okay, so here's the gene sequence for Physalis angulata. Again, I'm gonna go way in. Okay, and you can see the DNA sequences here, G A T A C C, etc. Okay. What you have to do though is we have to align these DNA sequences. And I did that simply for her data by selecting all the taxa and telling it to do an alignment. And I'm just doing a very simple genius alignment using the default settings. Okay. And what it does is it goes through this process of building an alignment for all of the species in, in, um, in Kim's study and produces an alignment file. And what that alignment file looks like when you look really close, so I'm going to zoom way in again, is it's showing us get rid of all these annotations, which shows us the gene sequence of uh, Waxy. Okay? And you can see here where it is that there are base pair changes in the different taxa okay, when you align these DNA sequences. So this is the alignment file that I then saved as a Nexus file for Kim's research. So I'm going to delete this because I always, I already, um, I already produced an alignment file for Kim, okay. and it's this Physalis alignment here. So I saved it as a Nexus file, and that's what's on Blackboard. Now there are a couple of tricky things. Many of you have more than two genes to merge into a matrix and to analyze both together and se separately. So for the separate analyses, you've done that in your systematics project. For, for the combined molecular 
analysis, um, it might be a little different. So let's take one that's pretty complex. Let's look at, um, I think it's, yeah. So Jim's Pyrola um, study. There are four gene sequences that are common amongst most of the taxa that he's interested in studying. And so I want to show you how it is that you merge together more than two matrices because the, mo the, the most number of matrices you've merged together at this point in wind cladonona is two. And it's a little different when you merge more than two matrices together. So I'm going to open up wind clada. And I'm going to go through this quickly because you guys have done the basics here. Okay. So the first thing I have to do is I have to open up my file. So I'm going to go into GEMS uh, file. These are all Nexus files that I saved. And I'm going to choose to open his ATP beta, R beta RBCL data. Okay, here's this, this um, matrix. Now I'm going to open his next molecular file, which is his ITS file. And what I'm going to do is merge, merge them in pairs. The program will not allow you to merge more than two matrices at one time. Okay. So what I'm going to say is I want to match the terminals. That is, I want to match the species by name. And I want to keep orphans. So I say, yes, merge the matrices. And now it says, OK, you have eight taxa, and you have this many characters in that matrix now. But we have two more matrices to add. So I select the next one down, which is turn LF, select open, go to matrix, new matrix merge. This is our merged matrix of these two matrices here. This is the new matrix. I'm making sure that match terminals by name is selected and keep orphans is selected. And I say merge matrix. Then I do the same thing for his last file. So this is his turn SG um, data. Okay. Now I want to merge all of the data together. So here is the merged matrix from before. Here is the new matrix here. Match terminals by, names, by name is selected and keep orphans is selected and I say merge matrices. Okay, so now what Jim has is this humongous uh, file containing his eight taxa of interest, okay, and it has 3,346 characters. Okay, so if I go all along here, these are all DNA sequence characters that Jim can now use in an analysis. Okay. Then it's exactly what you did for your systematics project. I get one of the things that I want to make sure of is that my outgroup, the outgroup that I want to use for my study is the first taxon here. Okay, so for example, if I wanted this taxon to be the first taxon, I double click on it so that it's highlighted in blue, and then I go up to terms, and I say move selected term, and I want to move it to the beginning. So I'm telling the program, hey, listen, above all, use this particular taxon as my, um, as my outgroup. That's not what I want. I actually want to use um, this taxon as my outgroup, so I'm going to change it back. I double-clicked on it, selected it, term, move selected term to the beginning, and I'm pretty much back to where I started. Okay. It doesn't matter what the order of these taxa are, are. Excuse me. It doesn't matter what the order of these taxa is. It just matters that your outgroup taxon is the first taxon. Then I go to analyze heuristics, keep all the defaults, and I say search, and boom, here is Jim's tree, okay, that he can use for his poster and modify the way he wants, and we went through that last time. And then the next thing you can do is you can do your bootstrap jack jackknife, just like you did before, 200 replicates, okay, and then the bootstrap analysis will run and spit out the tree exactly as it did before in your previous studies. In the case of this molecular data, you don't want to map every character on your tree. So, for example, Jim's dealing with something like, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's over 3,000 characters. 
If you map that onto a tree, it's going to be sort of ridiculous. And so for your molecular analyses, you can, you can just get away with providing a consensus tree um, if, you, if you get more than one most parsimonious tree with bootstraps values on the consent on that tree you don't have to worry about mapping all the different characters and character state changes on the tree like you did for your systematics project and you can see here that Jim's data is wicked solid so he um, is going to be in good shape with his analysis and then all he has to do now is collect all the morphological data for his um, in-group taxa and at least one of his out-group taxa definitely for this particular taxon and he's going to want to then run a morphological analysis and then what he can do is he can co potentially combine his molecular huge matrix with his morphological matrix and gets like, like one huge final tree. Okay, so this is exactly how it is that you're going to merge these data matrices and do your analyses. And that's it for now.